introduce our guest speaker. Uh, I invite you to welcome and show your appreciation to a couple of folks that have provided us with an opportunity to host our guest speaker today. Uh, first of all, Andy Heiss, if you'll stand please. Andy is the pastor of Desperation Church located here in Coleman City. They are hosting our guest speaker for a community-wide presentation tonight in the CHS Auditorium. Is that at 6, Andy? 7 o'clock. 7 o'clock. In scheduling, in scheduling that event, Andy graciously offered to coordinate this morning's presentation. Let's show our appreciation to Andy and the members of Desperation Church. Our guest speaker are, if you'll stand as I call your name and hold your applause till I've introduced everyone, are Justin Norton and Mark Ivey. Let's show our appreciation to these people. Our guest speaker this morning is a former quarterback at Brookhaven High School. in elevator up in Brookhaven, Mississippi. In 2005, he was named Mr. Football in the state of Mississippi after leading his school to a state championship. In that championship season, he threw for 2,173 yards and 24 touchdowns and rushed for another 1,394 yards and 20 touchdowns. At this time, I would like to show you a Rivals.com highlight clip of our guest speaker during that championship season. If you'll look for number 10 on the screen. a leading recruiting service, rated our guest speaker as one of the top 10 dual threat quarterback recruits in the nation in 2005. As such, 
He was offered many collegiate scholarships, but his childhood dream was to play for the Alabama Crimson Tide. In January, in January of 2005, our guest speaker began his dream come true when he signed a letter of commitment to play quarterback at the University of Alabama. At this time, please welcome to the stage to tell the rest of the story, Mr. Jimmy Johns. the city of Coleman, um, Coleman County to, uh, for allowing me to be here to share my story with you guys. Um, like I said, I come from a small town in Brookhaven, Mississippi. Guys, I don't know if you know, but it's about 12,000. Um, about one street light, not much, only a Walmart. Don't have a uh, Starbucks, we don't have a uh, Chick-fil-A or anything like that. All we, had, all we got is mom and pop stores. My journey started in 87. Uh, I was born in 87, June 19, 1987. In 92, I had a chance to see the Alabama Crimson Tide beat Miami for the national championship. I was five years old. At that moment, I talked to my mom, I looked at my mom, we're watching the game together. I said, I'm gonna play for Alabama. I said, that's where I wanna be, and that's where I'm gonna play. Well, coming up, I got the opportunity to grow in a family of five kids, single parent home, in a neighborhood that wasn't so good but I didn't use it as a hinder. My main message, God, is about perseverance, adversity. And I would be crazy to sit here and say that you won't face adversity. Because no matter who you are, no matter what color you are, no matter how much money you have, no matter where you're from, you're gonna face some type of adversity. The difference is being able to persevere, being able to fight through it, being able to get through the hard time, being able to get through the hardships. They said that I was player of the year, Mr. Football of Mississippi, uh, number one player, passed for 2,300 yards and rushed for 1,500 yards, 44 touchdowns, Gatorade player of the year, um, High School All-American, Mississippi Daily Dozen. But coming into the year, my senior year, they announced the Dandy Dozens. The Dandy Dozens are the top 12 players in the state. They called Jimmy John's name. I was a ninth player. I was a ninth name to be called. And most people think, it, think of it as an honor just to be Name as a daddy doesn't. Or when they call my name, God, I took it as a slap in the face. See, because I'm a leader. And in my mind, I was the best player in the state. The state just hadn't seen me yet. And I knew that I had to show that. Through my actions, I had to prove that. I didn't get in the papers, I didn't go in, anywhere, and I didn't say anything to anybody. I just set goals. I said I wanted to win the state championship. I said I wanted to pass with this many yards while I was doing so, and it happened. <coughs> At the end of the year, my goal was to be the number one player in the state. Now this time, Right down the road, we got the number one defensive tackle in the nation, who's playing with Kansas City right now. 
South Panola has the number one quarterback in the state. And in my mind, I'm just a city boy, I'm a country boy, who's, who's going to take over? Who's going to take this reign? But how? Because even at my own school, even at Brookhaven High School, I wasn't the fastest kid. I wasn't the strongest kid. I wasn't the smartest kid. So I was already faced with adversity just at my own high school. So how can you be the best player in the state if you don't even have the, what it takes to be the best player at school? If you don't have the God-given ability. One word, I mean, one thing that I know is hard work. Anything that I've ever gained has come from hard work. Anything that you guys will ever gain will come from hard work. Guys, I know it's tough waking up every morning coming to school, whether it's peer pressure, whether it's fights, or whether it's people talking behind your back, or whether it's this or that, you're going through some type of adversity. God, there's not a reason to quit. I signed with the University of Alabama in 2005. Three months later, I was playing as a true freshman. I don't know if you guys know what that means, but I played three months after being in high school, playing with 15 years, playing with kids from 15 to 18, I went to play with kids from grown men from 18 to 26 as a true freshman playing at the University of Alabama. It's exciting. My first two years there, special teams play of the year. Um, Coach Betsy, Javier Arenas. Anybody know Javier Arenas? Remember Javier? Javier? Oh, he's in Kansas City right now. I won the linebacker award for the spring. I'm up north. You gotta know where the carry is, right? You gotta remember Lionel McClain? Number eight draft pick in, 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 uh, in the combine, in the NFL. Number eight. Won the linebacker award over Rolando McClain. But those, those are one of my favorite awards. I won an award also called the Ozzie Newsom I Like the Practice Award. I know that seems strange that that's my favorite award, but the reason being is that it shows that no matter what day it is, no matter what situation, every day that I came to practice, I came scrapped up, I came ready. I wasn't just a game time guy. I was an everyday guy. And I came to work at the, through all the wood as a young guy in Mississippi. Following my mom, following my granddad. Every morning at five o'clock he would wake me up and he would say, son, let's go work. And we would go, and we would get in the wood truck and it would be freezing. And I don't know if you guys hauled wood before, but at five in the morning being an 11 year old kid, it's tough. It's tough. You want to quit. Even in football, you want to quit. And you learn life lessons. But my granddad would push me to persevere, to keep going, to keep fighting. Let's get this low. I got to college, playing for the best coach in the world, Coach Saban. Coach Saban will push us to the, to the brink of exhaustion to the point where physically we thought we couldn't last anymore to the point that we want to quit but he wouldn't let us he would push he would tell us God that wasn't enough run some more and we would be upset but we'd do it because that was my coach. 
And I'm a guy, I love to please. And it was pleasing to me that I was pleasing Coach Saban by keep by continuing to run, even through exhaustion. He would always say that football teaches you life lessons. And I never understood what he was saying until I had to go through my trial and error. Guys, I've had so many accolades, I had so many awards. I had so much given to me, I've earned so much. And in 2008, I became out of character, I jumped out of character. Character is strong. Character is a big thing. Does anybody know what character is? <laughs> no character. Character. Exactly. Exactly. Your character, your character is what you do when no one is watching. Guys, I've been in high school. Girls, I've been in high school. I've been on, on the sports. I've been the superstar. I've been the scrub. And your character is who you are, really. Your character is when you stand in the mirror at night and you look at the mirror and the person that you see and the thoughts that you think and the way that you're feeling, that's who you really are. See, I can stand here and I can say I'm um, this and I'm that, but when I go home, if I'm doing the wrong things, what does it make me? Bad character, right? Guys, I know that drugs are here, alcohol, it's all around. I've been in school before. I'm telling you this not from me just talking about it, but experience. Fifteen months ago, I was in prison. I was in prison for the sale of cocaine. Not only did it wasn't it on Channel 6, Fox News, but it was on CNN and ESPN and ABC and NBC and I think Larry King may have got a couple jokes in, I don't know, <laughs> maybe. But I was a linebacker at the University of Alabama, starting linebacker, just won a linebacker award from, from, for, from Mick Saban. Life's up high. Playing on TV every week. More money you can think about. More cars you can think about. Anything you want. And in one second, it all came to an end. Because my character was wrong. See, I played football. I was a straight A student. I did everything that the coaches wanted me to do, but when I got home at night, I was a drug dealer. So, I wasn't a football player. I wasn't a straight A student. I wasn't this poster kid that everybody saw. My real image and my true character was a drug dealer. Guys, girls, I know you hang in crowds, I know you click up. Just because you click up doesn't make it okay. I know when I was in school, me and my guys, me and my buddies, we would do stuff and we would party, we would hang in, and, and just because we were with each other, we wouldn't tell on each other, didn't make it okay. It was still wrong. I was sentenced to 15 years in prison. 
I had 13 felonies. And they all fell on a youthful offender. Here in the state of Alabama, anything under 20 years old falls into falls into youthful offender. And it carries one to three years in prison. Well, I had a cell charge on June the 18th at 11.50 something. And in four minutes, I think I would have been turning 21. That's how close I was to being charged as an adult and life being over with. Well, they gave me 15 years with one year to serve. I served one year in prison. Along the way, I had a son. I've got a son. I've got a son named Jimmy John Jr. He's five now. He's five. And before, prior to the prison, Jimmy Ben Jr. was a blessing because his dad played at Alabama. His dad on TV. His dad had John on the back of his name, on the back of his jersey. And he had Jimmy John Jr. on the back of his jersey. Well, in the process of me going to prison, it changed from being a blessing to a curse. Guys, I don't know if you know it, but your life will run parallel to your parents. So an article in the paper today, um, the Coleman Time did on me, and I've got, it has a picture of my son in. My son is five years old. Guys, when I was five years old, I was in 92. Guys are probably too, remember, too young to remember, but in 92, Alabama won the national championship. I was five. In 2011, Alabama won a national championship. Or well, 2012 this year, I'm sorry. Three takes five. My father was a quarterback in high school. My father was an All-American. My father ran the hurdles, so did I. My father threw the discus, so did I. My father was a starting quarterback with Steve McNair at Auburn State University. I played at Alabama. My father had a child myself when he was 19. I had my son at the age of 19. My father's a leader. He's charismatic. He's an employee. He's charming. He's a leader. So am I. I'm a leader. My son is a leader. I say it to say this. I met my father twice. Once at the age of seven. And then my senior year, in the third round of the playoff, now 21 to seven, with seven minutes to left in the chain, with seven minutes left. I didn't know my father, but our lives ran parallel. That's not the end of it though. My father had a child outside of wedlock. I did also. My father's career ended due to cocaine. So did mine. See, he was a user. And in the 80s or the 90s, or the 90s this was popular back there. That's what they did. I was a seller. I'm saying it to say that if I don't change, and I see this, and I evaluate it, I took those 13 months to evaluate my life, what I wanted, and to see this cycle. And it's up to me to break it. It's up to me to break it. Guys, your lives are going to be parallel to your parents, good or bad. It's up to you guys to change it. And you have your kids. At the age of 24, I'm 24 now, and I see things different. See, I was a selfish person. All I cared about prior was Jimmy. Well, going to prison, it hurt so many people in my life, and I didn't understand that. 
God, the thing that you do affects so many people in your life. Because if you get hurt, you go to prison, if you go to jail, not only are you going to be asked about it, but your brothers, your sisters, your parents, your aunties, your friends, anybody that has anything to do with you will be asked, what's going on with you? What's going on with so-and-so? So your actions affect everybody in your lives. My second night, my second night in prison, they slammed the doors, and at the time I'm in segregation because they said, Jimmy, you're too pro high profile of a name. We're not going to put you with everybody else. They slammed the door, and me being a grown man, guys, I cried, and I cried, and I cried. And I couldn't, I couldn't stop. I couldn't stop. Because finally, it was over. It was the beginning of the end of the hard times. And the guards had to come get me. And that night, I sat there and I wrote in my pad. I said, I want to do something. I said, I want to change. I want to do something to help people. I want to help kids. I want to help the community. I don't want to be a beast anymore. I don't want to be a monster anymore. I want to help. I want to help. What can I do? What can I do? So I thought, I thought, I said, you know what? I'm going to be a police. <laughs> I'm going to be a police. Who, who helps more than the police? So I said, I'm going to join the Brookhaven Police Department. Well, being locked up, I didn't want anybody to know I want to be a police, so I just went down BPD instead of Brookhaven Police Department because I didn't want the other inmates to know I want to be a police. <laughs> And, God, I don't know if you know, but with 13 felonies, I don't think you can be a police officer. So, change of plan. I slept, I finally got a peace of mind, and I woke up on the seventh day. God, no lie. I woke up the seventh morning in second day. So I woke up, I'm reading over my Bible. And I look down, and immediately it just jumps out. That BPD, it didn't stand for Brookhaven Police Department. It never did. Because if it did, I would have wrote Brookhaven Police Department. You know what it stood for? Better person daily. And that's my motto now. Better person daily. If we can do one good thing, one good deed, it doesn't cost us anything but a little time. I always ask the question, and I always get silent when I ask this question. But anybody have brothers? Does anybody have a brother? Guys, guys, does anybody have brothers? Any guys have brothers? You do? You do? When's the last time you told your brother you love him? It always gets it always does. It always gets quiet right there. Because I was that guy. I thought it was I thought I was too tough to tell another man or another male that I love him. And this is my brother. These are my brothers. These are the people I grew up with. And sometimes we get so wrapped up into self and into what we got going that we don't have just a kind word for the next person. I remember in high school, a girl wrote me a letter. And me, I was a superstar and I was this wild kid and bigger than life. But I always try to make time for the small people, or what we look at as the small people. The people who don't do much at school, the people who, who just go to school, or the people who get picked on. And I would always say something kind. And I remember getting a letter one day. 
And you know what, in, what was in this letter? A book. A book. It wasn't for me, though. <laughs> and that's the first thing I thought. No. Oh, she got a bullet in here. Hey. Come on. <laughs> that day, that evening before I left, we practiced late and going home, saw her and spoke to her. And told her to have a good day. I don't know what I said. Still can't remember. But the letter said she was going to kill herself. With this bullet. In kind words, it didn't cost me a penny. And I almost passed it up. But kind words saved this woman's life. Guys, if we could be better people daily, we can't change the world. Myself, me, I can't change the world. But by doing a kind action, I can change my surroundings. Because if I do a kind action, and the next person does, and the next person does, and we don't, we, don't have to, we don't have to do 10 or 12, we just do one. Everything will be better. A whole lot will be better. Because I'm not going to stand up and harp and harp and, and, and talk and talk and talk. But I do want to get the message out that we can change. And it starts at young adults. In our communities, we hold the key. And I say we because I, see, I think of myself as a young adult. I think of myself as like you guys. Because you guys think how I think. You guys are wanting the same things I'm wanting now. You guys want a car. You guys want a job. You guys want to establish yourselves as young people. God, the biggest thing to being successful to being, and being able to persevere through adversity because of being locked up in prison, losing everything that I owned, having everything taken away and confiscated, having to sell my vehicle, in prison so I can have something to eat. Having to sleep on a six foot bed. Got on six three. Three inches gotta go somewhere. <laughs> but they don't care where they go as long as they go. When you're in prison. They don't care. You gotta put them somewhere. And being able to face that adversity, being able to go through that. How? How? By listening. Football. The game showed me how to, how, how, how to face that. Guys, I don't want you to have to learn. I don't want you to have to go through trial and learn. I want you guys to be able to hear it and learn from me. A great coach once said, and you got to probably remember, Derek Dewey. He's a Tennessee Volunteers coach. He's a Tennessee Volunteers fan. Uh, go balls. But he, he, said, he said something that caught my eye. And I realized what he was saying. See, his team, his team was full of staff infections. You guys know what staff infections are, right? It goes from being in the dirt and getting scars and being uncleanly. Not clean yourself the proper way. So this coach took the time to call in people and to get them to come in and after practice, give his team showering lessons. How to take the proper shower. Right? Right, yeah, it's crazy, right? It's crazy. Okay. Right, yeah, how, how to take the proper shower. And me, I always go top to bottom, right to left, and I go down. And that's my routine. I don't know if that's a proper direction, but that's how I go. But, by using that, and speaking in parable, he said, 
He went to practice, and the guy with a lot of yagging, and the guys wasn't finishing, and they wouldn't finish the line. And Dooley got mad. He got upset, and he called practice. He stopped it. And he called out the guys who didn't finish. And he said, I bet I can tell just from practice the players who have staff infections. <laughs> I don't know if you can't physically, if it's covered up, see a staff infection. Uh, but this coach said he can tell by the way his team was practicing which one of the players had staff infections. And he said the same guys, and I don't know if you guys know how it is washing your feet in the shower. Or I wash your feet in the shower. We all do, right? Everybody does, right? Every time? Every time? Everybody wash every time? Oh. There go character. There go back to your character now. You're not washing every time. What kind of character do you have? And I didn't have any character. So guess what? Standing under the shower with the shower head going on, and I'm watching my direction from right to left from top to bottom. And I wash right to left from top to bottom, and I rinse off. And I've got a superstition, I've got to wash three times. I've got to rinse off, wash over and rinse off three times. And what I notice is I would wash off from right to left from top to bottom, and I would stop here. <laughs> But in my mind, my feet were always clean. Because the water is running right off of me and soap is hitting my feet and going through the drain. And I do it three times. And I was just too lazy to, y'all know how to, to balance on one foot in the shower and it's slippery and you're washing and, oh. It's, it, I mean, you know how tough it is. Exactly. Now imagine doing it from left to right, from top to bottom, three times. You get lazy sometimes, right? Derek Dooley said, he said, I can tell which guy has staff infection by the way you're practicing. Listen. He said, the same guys who don't have enough self-discipline and heart and character to finish through the line when you run your wind sprints are the same guys who don't have enough self-discipline, heart, and character to pick up that one foot each time that we shower. His guys were not finishing. I wasn't finishing. I didn't finish. And I'm not saying this, guys. I'm not saying this that you guys are gonna get a new shower routine and you guys, <laughs> you guys are gonna wash your feet every time you get in the shower now because you're gonna think about Derek Dooley and getting a staff protection. Uh, but I didn't finish. I wasn't finished. And when you put it in perspective, and you put it all together, and when you think about it, the things that it takes to be successful, self-discipline, work ethic, perseverance through adversity, and character. All those things. You can't just possess some traits and slack on everything else. And that's what I was doing. I was letting my talent get me past, and I was having bad character. Guys, my character is strong now. Every time that I take a shower, I wash my feet. <laughs> Guys, any task that I do, 
I want to be the best. Guys, if I'm picking up paper, and it's a group picking up paper, I guarantee you that Jimmy John's is going to have the biggest set of paper. Because it's my character. That's, how, that's who I am now. I don't shortcut it anymore. I don't show face and then be something different when I look in the mirror. God, this is the only way that we can change. We got to change self first. And we got to grow character. We got to be the same person standing on this stage that I am when I look in the mirror when I get out of the shower. God, I know the problems here. I've heard the problems here. I've heard the drug problems in Coleman. You don't have to be a part of it. You don't have to say, my friend does this, so I'm going to do it. You don't have to say, my friend's not going to tell on you, so hey, it's fine. And I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. Because in the end, it's still wrong. And I'm standing before you as Mr. Football, as the number one player in the state, as a true freshman at the University of Alabama, as someone being on TV every weekend, and telling you, no matter who you are, if you commit a crime or if you do wrong, you're going to get punished. You're going to get punished. There's no exceptions. It doesn't matter who your parents are. It doesn't matter how much money we have. It doesn't matter if Jack across the street was doing it first. You seen him, you can get him. He's wrong too. It starts here, us. It starts with me. It starts with you. The leaders. Leaders have got to be leaders. That's what went wrong with me. I stopped being a leader. I stopped being the man in charge. I stopped being Jimmy Johns. I started being a follower. I got out of character. And it caused me 13 months of my life. It caused me humiliation. It caused my family humiliation. It caused me going back to Mississippi and going to hide for four months, not leaving the house. For four months. As I speak now, I'm on probation now. It gave me 15 years. And if I mess up, I gotta back them up. It's tough, right? It's tough that I gotta walk a straight line, I gotta do the right thing, right? No. Because that's what I'm supposed to do, right? I'm supposed to walk a straight line, I'm supposed to do the right thing. You know why it's tough? Why it would be tough? If I was doing the wrong thing. If I had my mindset on doing the wrong thing. Got it. Well, I guess they're trying to get me off of here. I don't know if somebody turned me off the back or. But, guys. I'm, I'm, I'm the same person that you are. I have a heart. I have goals. I set goals. I went to high school. And just because I was in Alabama doesn't make me any different. When you do things, people put you on a pedestal. I didn't put myself on a pedestal. Hard work put me there. 
but the sand. The higher you climb the ladder, the more you tell it is exposed. Right? The higher you climb the ladder, the more you tell it is exposed. Guys, right now, Facebook, everybody got a Facebook page? Everybody got a Facebook? Yeah, I'm on Facebook too. I'm on Facebook. But guess what? I mean, with me, you know, people put me on on the pedestal. I can't, even, I can't post Facebook pictures because people think it, it's it's entertainment. You know. Whereas Kathy, she posts Facebook pictures. Everybody happy. Hey, uh, pretty baby, vacation, you know. I mean, I'm, I'm if I do it, hey, he's showing off. He's wrong. God, it's an honor to be here. God, I'm here talking to you from the heart. So I don't want you guys to go through the things I've been through. Because it's been tough. Trouble is easy to get into, and it's hard to get out of. I now got a record. My record's gonna last forever. It's gonna be there. Once you, if you get in trouble, when you get in trouble, when you face adversity, when you go through it, persevere. Because you gotta keep fighting. You gotta keep pushing. No matter how tough it gets, you gotta keep pushing. Mentally, physically exhausting. Keep pushing. Some will happen. Some will get better. And I'll leave with this, guys. Guys, our community and the and the rate of our youth, we're going backwards. We're going down. Guys, if, 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 if your city is going to get better, you are the guys and women who have got to build it. The grown-ups can't do it anymore. They've had a shot. They did their best. They, they brought you guys up. What it seems that. Seniors, that's right. All you guys will be in college next year, and it's a lot worse than college. In college, you gotta have, you gotta be mentally tough. Because it's not, your parents aren't there. No one's there to wake you up. No one's there to tell you, hey, Jack, go to school, or hey, Jimmy, go to class, or hey, Jimmy, did you do the test? No, it's you. Junior's coming up, you guys are about to leave this school. This will be your school in six months. You guys got to get on the right track. You got to continue to do the right thing. And if we continue to do the same things, we'll get the same results. Thank you, God, for allowing me to be here. It's been an honor. I want to thank the city of Coleman. Again, I want to thank Dr. Bowden, Andy, Mr. Mark. Any questions? Anybody want to know anything? Anything? Thank you, God.
is learning today to lead tomorrow. And uh, uh, and the word that comes to mind after this presentation is real. Uh, I believe you heard some real information today. And it's, it's things that we can learn from today so that we can lead tomorrow. And, uh, okay, I, uh, I would ask you to do this before we leave. If, if you turn to a friend and make a commitment to keep Coleman City headed in the right direction by saying that you will do one kind act today. We make that commitment to an agent.